We think that a lot of the work in terms of the cure is going to be done by the fact that we are experiencing a historically large shock to real incomes in this country coming from uh, uh, outside the country. So it's not a situation that calls for a, an emergency type of, of move, and I think he very clearly took 75 basis points off the table. We think there are risks on the upside to inflation, but, on, but we also think that the, the core story here is a big real income shock to the country. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Friday, the 6th of May. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Bear scare, U.S. stocks crater, wiping out $1.3 trillion. The sell-off continues in Asia and Europe. The Holocaust fly in Frankfurt. Well, Austria's Robert Holtzman says the ECB could decide on a rate hike next month, with other governing council members pushing for July. And Chelsea is close to signing a sale agreement with a group led by the former Guggenheim Partners president, Todd Bowley. A deal could be reached today. That's according to Bloomberg reporting. Now, first thing is first, let's check in on the markets. So we did have quite a bloodbath when it came uh, to the stocks yesterday. Some of them, including the Nasdaq, the S&P, down between 3 and 4 percent. Now, we're still seeing quite a lot of pressure on the European stocks, down 1 percent. But, of course, it's a different story here because of valuation. A lot of the stocks here were cheaper. So when investors panic about inflation, Maybe they look to the U.S. first because, of course, uh, there's been a lot of investors buying tech day in, day out because they were a, a safe asset. The U.S. 10-year yield, we just had a great conversation with our Stephen Major, uh, 3.07. Stephen Major of HSBC saying, look, his calls on Treasuries stick, but there could be a policy mistake coming our way. And then when it comes to crude oil, 108, this is a story of the EU also trying, of course, to get away from Russian oil and gas and the S&P futures uh, down, actually down some four-tenths of a percent. Again, this is is not the kind of major pressure that we saw yesterday. We also look at China, and we've seen in the last couple of days some of these markets really change on flipping out uh, very quickly. So watch out for the next couple of hours as we get into that European Open. This is a picture across the board in Europe. If we get that up, but the main story is actually bonds and the difference between Italian BTBs and German Bunds. This is as we also see the ECB becoming much more hawkish, and then we have a lot of pressure on some of the travel and leisure, the CAC 40 down 1% uh, here, the FTSE over in the UK down some six tenths of 8%. So just today, after notching the biggest rally in two years, the S&P yesterday uh, tumbled with 95% of its companies moving lower. Traders really expressing their concern that officials could struggle to fight persistently high inflation amid the lingering threat of a recession. This is not a good day. This is not a good year. We are already uh, pretty firmly in a big bear market. At the end of the day, it's about inflation. I think that the market is trying to determine what is the most important factor going forward. So for the Fed, it's very clear. They are a single mandate Fed right now. They are only focused on inflation and they're telling us that. I believe the market's going to go at least 50 percent below its peak. We think things are overdone. You, you've gotten rid of some of the excesses and, and the underlying fundamentals are still relatively good for now. So to talk about this correction, to talk about the markets, we're joined by Bloomberg's markets editor, Edimond de Velt, and John Bilton, head of global multi-asset strategy at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Now, we're looking at a brontosaurus because this is, without a doubt, my morning must-read. Bloomberg opinion columnist John Authors writes in his latest column that the recent volatility seen in the markets reflects a slow-moving realization of the pain of inflation. Now, he uses the Jeremy Grantham analogy of the brontosaurus. I'm actually, I feel like I'm an expert on dinosaurs. Uh, and brontosaurus basically has a brain and a nervous system that were so inefficient that it would take a long time to realize that it had bitten in that it had been bitten in the tail so we're joined by John and Eddie for the very latest John I mean this actually I feel like is a great analogy because you had the inflation data you had the Fed data and suddenly the market's saying wait how do I trade inflation then we saw this huge sell-off yesterday I think it's an interesting analogy but let's actually look at what markets do. Yeah. Markets are a pricing <laughs> mechanism for the future, yeah. not what's just happened. Yeah. And I think what the world is trying to figure out, and one of the reasons we're seeing all this volatility in the um, stocks all around the globe, is because we're trying to calibrate 
you know, where is peak hawkishness, where is peak inflation, how do we deal with an economy which below the surface actually has quite a lot of good data still coming but John, out. But what happened yesterday? So if you look at the Nasdaq, if you look at the S&P down <coughs> 5%, this mm. is the inflation data and what we heard from the Fed. What are they looking at that we didn't see last week? Well, I think you, know, you had a big rally out of the Fed um, announcement when 75 bips was taken off the table, you know, some sort of relief that we're not going to get this sort of further reach into hawkishness. And then questions coming out when we see data, uh, or we see the announcements from the Bank of England. Yeah. We see the zero COVID measures being doubled down on in China. Issues that are continuing to worry right. the market. We are trying to calibrate to a new regime and also at the same time figure out what that regime is. Eddie, what do you make of what we saw yesterday? And I know, I mean, John is not giving me full marks for my brontosaurus analogy, I think it's but great. the reaction function, <laughs> I feel it, it just takes a long time to play out. So, how many more volatile days could we see? Yeah, Francine, I think that's because you could pick the Brontosaurus. I think what we really wanted to see is either a T-Rex <laughs> or a or or, or or even Godzilla here. Because I think I think, you know, I think I think the, the Fed has really put the spanner in the works here. And I think, you know, we could see something really scary coming out of the woods. Because I think what markets are asking themselves at the moment is, why not 75? Why is it that the Fed is suddenly saying, well, hang on a second, 50 is enough? But 75 may just be enough to pull to, to topple this economy over, and I think I think what they are what they are worried about, you know, um, to just I, I I think they're worried about the bits that they can't see. So you know, I think I think they 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 worried about what we're going to learn and and just uh, just how scary the growth picture is uh, at the yeah. time when inflation is so hot. Because I think I think just to stretch that analogy, I st think stagflation is the T-Rex in this conversation. Okay, and then, I mean, John's one of the, you know, the, the guys that calls the markets better. So you're a velociraptor in this. What do you see? Where do you tactically actually look at market corrections? So, you know, markets correct through bull phases. They're, you know, that's been known for some time. You know, the idea that we are seeing a growth slowdown, massive and accelerating inflation, I think the data are beginning to suggest we may be peaking out in that. When it comes to the inflation level, you know, prevailing levels of inflation have caught central banks by surprise. There is no mistake in that. Why? Why? Because I think it was seen initially as being a purely supply-side issue linked to COVID and then latterly to the uh, invasion of Ukraine. Today, I think it's being clear that there's a second-order effect where it's creeping through into wages. Things like average hourly earnings today are going to be watched very, very closely. The core CPI print yep. next week is going to be watched very closely. The Fed will not step into dovish territory until they know that they've started to win against inflation. But at the moment, if they're responding to a sequential increase in yep. inflation, which they can't see either, they may risk making a policy mistake in the other direction. Underneath the surface, though, labour is strong, growth is solid. You know, look at services, ISMs. They not came bad. in very yep. strong. You know, this is John, not an economy fighting for growth. Let, let's also hear from the Bank of England governor, who spoke to our Guy Johnson yesterday about incomes. We think that a lot of the work in terms of the cure is going to be done by the fact that we are experiencing a historically large shock to real incomes in this country coming from uh, outside the country. So it's a terms of trade shock in that sense. Import prices are rising. That's predominantly energy, food and, and, and some core goods. Eddie, if you look both at stocks and bonds, they've actually been down pretty significantly this year. Like, who's right? When does this stop? Mm -hmm. We've never seen anything like this in the last three decades. Yeah, but I think we're going to have to get used to seeing more of this in the next decade, right? Because I think that 60-40 portfolio, uh, a lot of people have been, have been, you know, talking about it becoming extinct like those dinosaurs we've been talking about. But I think, you know, I, I, I think this is a real risk because I think stocks have become so dependent on ever lower rates. And, you know, rates are going to have to go up if inflation keeps going where it's going. And even the long end of the curve, we're going to have to see that move higher. And I think that that just makes that that just makes the the, the the situation for the stock market broadly precarious but i do think that that right now we are going to see you know we we're seeing the seeds of the future economy so what we is what we're going to see here is a lot of active management a lot of stock picking and i think that's where people yeah. are going to make their money
Okay, we're going to push John to see how he earns those fees. He's been doing a great job, but, you know, we'll push a little bit further to see what clients want from him. Eddie, thanks so much. Bloomberg's Markets Editor, Eddie Van Der Valt and John Bilton. I'm not picking on you. Head of Global Multi-Asset Strategy at J.P. Morgan Asset Management stays with us. Coming up, China orders central government agencies to replace foreign-branded personal computers with domestic alternatives within two years. That story is next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, China has ordered central government agencies and state backed corporations to replace foreign branded personal computers with domestic alternatives within two years. It marks one of Beijing's most aggressive efforts too far, so far to eradicate key overseas technology from within its most sensitive organizations. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's chief Asia economics correspondent, Enda Curran. So, Enda, this feels very significant. How far will they go? Well, you're still talking about maybe 50 million PCs being impacted by this, Francine. It does accelerate what China has been trying to do in recent years, which is build more of its own self-reliance on homegrown technology and homegrown hardware. So it certainly speaks to that ongoing push. And on the other side of the ledger, of course, it speaks to uh, concerns over vulnerabilities on the national security front. Remember, some of China's national champions like Huawei have been targeted by the U.S. with sanctions and other measures over recent years that have really crippled them. Well, China is obviously trying to shore up its defenses in that front now. And I think more broadly, it speaks to the idea that China is trying to uh, push for self-reliance. There is that sense of decoupling, decoupling or fragmentation of the global economy going on. And it certainly doesn't speak to any meeting of minds when it comes to even economic relations between uh, the world's two biggest economies, China and the U.S. Thank you so much. Uh, our Bloomberg Chief Asia correspondent there, Enda Kern, with, of course, security implications between China and the West. Now, top EU policymakers are also meeting in Salzburg today to discuss the bloc's response to rising inflation. That's as growing number of ECB governing council members push for faster normalization that could see a rate hike in the coming months. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's European correspondent, Maria Tadeo, who's reporting live from Salzburg, beautiful Salzburg. Maria, you had a wonderful interview earlier on, and I have to say the biggest headache for European politicians and officials, of course, inflation. What does it mean for ECB? Yes, Francine, and you know, it's, it's very clear now when you talk to uh, officials here, they'll tell you the biggest concern is the inflation picture because a lot of the factors we can't control. Francine, a lot of this is about the energy situation. We know that the second round effects of those uh, sanctions that the European Union is pushing through will have an impact on petrol prices, fuel prices. All of this goes straight uh, to consumers, but also then you have the food angle uh, to this. Ukraine is a huge agricultural uh, hub, and of course, they can't harvest in these conditions. So for European officials, it really is about the inflation picture showing that they have the credentials, the credibility to really signal that they're well anchored and the European Central Bank can get a hold of it. The reality is, Francine, having said that, is that the numbers do show runaway inflation. There is now open talk here. Perhaps they don't want to say it publicly about this imminent recession, this stagflation also happening, and possibly this push, this big drive to get a rate hike that could happen maybe June, July, or now the market. And, and Christine Lagarde has guided investors very clearly. First you end QE and then we move into the hike. But I think at this point, Francine, the sense of direction is very clear. There will be a hike in the summer. It's just a question of when, although the market believes probably in July. We have seen from a number of officials, yep. including uh, Mr. Holtzman, the central banker of Austria, where I'm in, saying why not do it in June? Yeah, I mean, and it does, you know, that's widening, of course, spreads between Italian BDPs and German Bunds. So thank you so much. Our European correspondent, Maria Tadeo, reporting from Salzburg. Let's go back to John Bilton, head of global multi-asset strategy at JP Morgan Asset Management. John, you have China, and uh, there's definitely, I guess, more concern about their interaction with the West, uh, trying to get some of the supply chains back home. And at the same time, you have Europe dealing with this inflation. Where do you find value, given everything that's going on in the markets, it, you know, where do you find value for stocks? Well, I think first and foremost, you've got to look at your overall positioning. You know, you've got to trust the data more than the headlines. It's really that simple. The data are still telling us a story that there is underlying resilience in the economy. But markets are repricing 
to an uncertain future today. Right. And to do that, they are reducing the levels of valuation you're prepared to pay for future cash flow. So what do you look for? You look for solid cash flow. You know, parts of the real asset market, parts of the real estate market provide that. You look at strong cash flow return in stocks. You look for those what, energy? The, the big dividend players. At the moment, energy really has had a very strong upsurge. But it, remember, this may not be a permanent state of the world. As we see ESG pressures continuing, you know, we're enjoying the you know, benefits from higher energy prices coming through today, but that may not last. So we have to be a little bit more selective and tactical. Is, is it binary, the outcome, that either we get through this and we have a soft landing, or actually we could see a, a pretty heavy recession if the war is long-lasting? Um, I think at the moment the setup isn't there for a recession imminently. Could we get to a point where central banks have to cool the economy, have to cool demand in order to address inflation? That is certainly a risk, but I don't think it's a 2022 risk. It's more of getting into, you know, certainly into next year at the, at the earliest. Underlying the economy, we've still got 13, 14% additional excess savings above the 2019 level uh, that we have across um, the um, EU. Yeah. As a result, there's a lot of resilience. Higher prices can be managed um, to a degree. But what do you make the difference? I mean, if you look at the differential, so you have PBOC against the Fed in terms of what the kind of support they're giving to the economy, but you also have a very different valuation, you know, picture in Europe for the US. How do you play those two? Well, I think in Europe, Europe has always tended to trade at a discount to the US, and the discount is relatively wide. But the US, you know, is down, if, depending on where you see forward earnings on the S&P 500, 230, 240 over the next 12 months, you're on 17 or 18 times earnings. That is not as aggressively valued as it was. It's not as cheap as Europe, but Europe, of course, has the geopolitical angle as well. I would go back to the underlying shape of the economy. We do not expect a recession in 2022. It is, the risks have risen for 2023, but the resilience of balance sheets, the low levels of leverage across yep. the banking sector, yep. all point to the ability to be able to see this recovery continue. I know you're a huge Chelsea fan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. You're not a Chelsea fan, but I'm actually, not, no. do you feel, I, know, I know you're not, but I am. I just want a, a buddy to be, to be a Chelsea fan with me. I mean, we're seeing so much money, especially, you know, like private equity trying to get into a Premier League. Is this a good deal? Um, in all honesty, I have no idea. I, I mean, yeah. I'm far So you didn't from put a, a consortium? Fan. <laughs> together. I'm afraid you're asking the wrong person on football finance. What? Is there a lot of cheap money actually out there just waiting to be spent on the sidelines, football or not? I mean, I'm, I'm making a joke about no, football, no, but it's there. So, well, certainly one of the issues for private equity, as we know, going into this period of volatility, we've not heard so much of it lately, was that that large amount of cash, that large amount of dry powder on the sidelines. But the thing is, bear in mind, there's also a lot of investable opportunity out there. We're seeing automation continue, yeah. you know, improved technology, improved communication, communications, you know, next generation robotics, there's a lot to invest in. Valuations have come down. If anything, you know, opportunities for no. private equity, they take the long view. They're not looking at the next couple of Fed meetings. They're looking 10 years out. And so that cash on there, um, <laughs> investable cash, actually could be good for growth over the longer run. Are you a cricket fan? Oh, yes. Well, there you go. Cricket and rugby. <laughs> I knew he'd be. John Bilton, thank you so much for joining us. Thank Head you. of Global Multi-Asset Strategy at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Now, coming up later in the program, we'll also speak to Patrick Armstrong. He's Plurini Wealth Management he Partner and Chief Investment Officer. We'll discuss sell off the Fed. Maybe we'll talk a bit of football, but of course, we'll talk about the upcoming U.S. jobs data as well. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Bloomberg has learned the European Union is proposing a revision to its Russian oil ban to give Hungary and Slovakia an extra year to comply. Under the plan, the two countries will have until the end of 2024 to stop imports. Most member states will be expected to phase out Russian fuel by the end of this year. Now, ING has reported first quarter profit that missed analyst estimates after the bank set aside more than expected 
to cover the cost of loans going sour because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The biggest Dutch lender put aside 834 million euros related to its Russia exposure. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission is said to be reviewing Elon Musk's $44 billion Twitter takeover, setting up a deadline in the next month for the agency to decide whether to conduct an in-depth review of that transaction. Under U.S. merger law, Musk is required to notify the FTC of the transaction and wait at least 30 days before closing to allow an investigation into potential antitrust concerns. Chelsea Football Club is close to signing a sale agreement with a group led by former Guggenheim Partners president Todd Foley. Sources say Foley's consortium could reach agreement as soon as today with Chelsea and its owner, the sanctioned Russian oligarch Roman Abramovich. A deal would end a weeks-long bidding process for one of the biggest English football clubs. And Peloton is said to be exploring a sale of a sizable minority stake to shore up business as the company's stock continues to sink. The hope is to find a big-name corporation or private equity firm that can help validate the business with its investment. Peloton's value has plummeted from those pandemic highs. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Leanne, I know you won't break my heart, so I know you won't say you hate Chelsea, but a lot of people are at the moment. And Lucy and I, we're hanging strong Chelsea supporters. Coming up, we talk to Plurimi Wealth Management Partner and Chief Investment Officer Patrick Armstrong. This is Bloomberg. Bear scare, U.S. stocks crater, wiping out $1.3 trillion. The sell-off continues in Asia and Europe. The Hawks fly in Frankfurt. The ECB's François Villeroy de Gallo says interest rates may be raised back above zero this year. And Chelsea is close to signing a sale agreement with a group led by the former Guggenheim Partners president, Todd Bowley. A deal could be reached today. That's according to Bloomberg reporting. Now, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. We'll get on to Chelsea. We're fans here on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Not everyone, but a lot of us are. But first to the markets, because it was a wild ride when you look at what happened overnight in the U.S. This is either, uh, we'll speak to Patrick Armstrong about it. This is either short positionings, people getting out, or it's really misunderstanding how you trade inflation and the longer term implications of what's happening. My producer is just writing in for a correction. I think we're more Arsenal fans than Chelsea. Stocks sliding, bonds sliding, the dollar rising as inflation and rising borrowing costs. China's COVID lockdowns also overall depressing sentiment. Now, U.S. markets plunged yesterday, wiping $1.3 billion in value. It just continues what has been a remarkable year in markets with both stocks and bonds posting significant losses. We're now joined by Patrick Armstrong, Chief Investment Officer at Plurimi Wealth. Patrick, I know you like the Brontosaurus analogy, which is there's a nervous system that maybe takes a, a bit of time to connect between, you know, you, how you look at inflation, how you trade it. But what happened yesterday in U.S. markets? Yeah, John Arthurs is great with his metaphors about the Brontosaurus. And it's, um, I think, Jerome Powell has got to decide between which policy mistake he's going to make. And I think the markets really rejoiced that it looked like he was going to take the dovish route, which meant I don't want to provoke a recession. And then it sunk in that, okay, if he's not going to do that, he's going to keep stoking inflation, and that comes with its own consequences. And you don't want to be long duration if inflation yep. is being stoked. So Patrick. bonds sell off, high multiple stock sell off. You're so depressing. I mean, when you, when you look at what policy mistake, which one's better in terms of policy mistake to do? I think right now um, he's making the right decision, um, letting inflation stay hot um, and run the risk of that rather than poking, provoking the imminent recession. Um, he said there's a potential for a softish landing, and yeah. he's kidding himself, trying to kid us. Um, you've got to give people hope in his job, but uh, it can't be done. After the trillions of experimental policies that have been put in place, yeah. you've got too much volatility and swing of things. You've got inflation running near double digits and you've got a slowing economy already. So you've got to be hiking into a slowing economy. There's the Brontosaurus. Patrick Armstrong, I have to tell everyone, is one of the, the, the foremost experts on dinosaurs. I mean, this is <laughs> what having young kids does to you. Patrick, is, is there a danger of a market reaction or a market function? Or is it that, as you say, because of these possible two policy mistakes, it's almost binary, the outcome? Um, You've got to look what the Fed does, but um, 
Just look, if you pull up a chart going back to when I was born in 1970, every Fed hiking cycle, there's almost always been a recession following it. So the Fed almost has always hiked too far. And the only time they've not provoked a recession is when there's been some sort of exogenous positive shock yeah. that uh, basically happened at the same time as the hiking. So in the mid-90s, they were hiking. The recession didn't follow because of the massive productivity increase from the Internet. In the early 80s, you had Saudi Arabia and OPEC really pumping crude into the market, giving the U.S. consumer a real tax cut. But Where's that going to come from this time in this hiking cycle, that exogenous shock on the positive side of things? But it's also 10 years of ultra-loose monetary policy and QE. Yeah, and that's led to malinvestment in non-productive assets. It's led to people buying dream stocks, hoping to get rich mm -hmm. quick. And it's taken basically all the, the moral hazard of it. It's basically yeah. taken risk away from people. And now we're getting back into an environment where you do have to think there's consequences to what I buy. Whereas a few years ago, you had to buy something and just wait for it to go up. Are you expecting more of a correction? And actually, if you look at the models for fee earnings, then it, it could potentially change everything for asset managers. Um, yeah, asset managers are seeing, um, I think, the chart you just started this segment with, with equities and bonds both being down 10% year to date. And the stagflation is toxic for traditional assets. It's um, bad, the stag is bad for the equities, the flation is bad for bonds. And you've got to be a little bit more creative. You want to be short duration, you want to be long companies that are producing cash flow today, not that have a hope of producing cash flow in 10 years' time. You want to be long higher quality credit with shorter duration um, and you get returns equal to inflation on that now. A few years ago if you did that you were losing purchasing power but with spreads widening and interest rates going up you can preserve your capital relatively safely for the first time as so well. Who's right? Bonds or stocks? Or should we not look at it like that? Um, well they're both right here today. They're both down 10 percent and that's just an acknowledgement that we're in a stagflationary environment. Um, I think bond yields are going to continue to move higher because I think Powell's going to blink and say I accept inflation rather than provoking recession. But um, that's an uncertainty. It's a, a guess on which way Powell's going to go. He's shown with his pivot yeah. in 2018 that that's how he thinks about things. Yeah. But uh, it's still uncertain. I mean, we, we saw that with him taking off 75 basis points off the table. Was that a mistake? I don't know if it was a mistake. He wanted to calm the markets and said we're going to go about things deliberately. Um, he's showing he's not asleep at the wheel that he said there's going to be 50 and 50 for the next two as well. Um, an extra 25 basis points is symbolic more than having a real yeah. economic impact, I think. So I don't, everything he does can be viewed as a mistake because there's going to be no right answers, unfortunately. He's got to find the answer that's less wrong. Um, and I expect that'll be still provoking inflation and trying to avoid the recession. Patrick, thanks so much. Patrick Armstrong, their chief investment officer at Plurimi Wealth, stays with us. Also coming up, the sale of Chelsea Football Club appears to be moving closer with the deal possibly being finalized today. Patrick Armstrong, not a Chelsea fan, so I forbid to talk about this. We have the latest on that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. To the markets, because there's quite a lot going on. It started yesterday overnight in the U.S., where we saw huge losses across the board. If we have an asset board, we'll bring it up, because we saw the S&P 500, the Nasdaq, and others really being slammed. Now, Bloomberg has also learned that a deal regarding the sale of Chelsea Football Club may be announced today. That would end a two-month process after Roman Abramovich was sanctioned by the U.K. government following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Let's get the story with our Laura Wright. Laura, who's a new owner likely to be and what would a deal actually say about this American influence in the Premier League? Well, some exciting news, Francine, for your local club, Chelsea. The new owner expected to be American Todd Bowley, former president at Guggenheim Partners and the founder of Elridge. Look, he has experience owning sports teams. He's the co-owner of the LA Dodgers, a U.S. baseball team. There is a sense of urgency surrounding this deal, considering the special operating license that the U.K. government granted Chelsea will run out on May the 31st. The government have signaled little appetite to extend it with the culture secretary Nadine Dorries admitting Chelsea is already functioning on borrowed time. This has been a competitive two-month bidding process and if successful Todd Bowley's consortium have fought off some 
stiff competition from other wealthy U.S. private equity investors, including the Bain Capital co-chairman Steve Paliuka and the Apollo Global Management co-founder, um, whose name escapes me at this present time, Francine. But look, this is important because the influence of Americans in the Premier League, already eight out of 20 Premier League football clubs have some form of American influence. Three of those, Liverpool, Arsenal, Man United, are wholly owned. And the Premier League, look, it's seen as attractive for a number of reasons. It's considered as the most lucrative football league in the world. It's seen as less monetized, less commercialized than U.S. sports league. And yes, football, it's a classic trophy asset. It is a trophy asset. How much? I mean, I keep on here. I was asking everyone I knew, saying, are you, are you putting a consortium together? Are you trying to buy Chelsea? And they're like, three billion? No way. It's too expensive. What kind of money's around this deal? Yeah, well, it could be actually up to £4 billion, Francine. We should see details later today if that deal is, in fact, signed. But there was, of course, that contentious £1.5 billion loan from Roman Abramovich that was thought to perhaps derail the deal. But it emerged that, after all, Abramovich, he doesn't want that loan repaid. A statement was released by his spokesperson overnight. But this is in the context of an owner that has won five Premier League titles, five FA Cup titles, two Champions League titles with Chelsea. And he just wants to see that the new owners will continue to invest in the academy, in the women's team, and also that all-important stadium redevelopment. Francine, when it happens, I know you're going to be first there with the season ticket. I mean, of course. I can actually hear them because we live so close. It's very <laughs> distracting where you're trying to be on TV from your living room. Laura, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Laura Wright. We're back with Patrick Armstrong, Chief Investment Officer at Plurimi Wealth. Patrick, you should have offered that extra billion to get it. <laughs> you, you stopped at two billion. Is it, what is this? I mean, is, is it a trophy or are they actually going to try and make money out of it? Um, they're going to try to make money out of it, and they will make money out of it. Um, anytime you're buying an asset from a forced seller, you're usually going to get a good price. So there is enough competition that it's not going to be an egregious price, but it's going to be an attractive price. And in a normal Terrible for the fans. Terrible for the fans. You don't want an owner that's <laughs> trying to make money if you're a fan of the club. Um, there's other things they can do that can immediately monetize it. I think I've read a survey once that if any London club just change their name from Chelsea to London Chelsea, um, they'd get a billion from that from China and America who don't know where Chelsea is and they love London, things like that. So there may be some things that are really off-putting for Chelsea fans that they're trying to make a pound or a dollar. Um, London not just Chelsea, trying you're to... breaking my heart. I feel like me and Lucy, <laughs> no, the floor the manager, <laughs> we're like the only fans left out there of Chelsea. But, yeah, those are the kind of levers when you get private equity investors uh, trying to maximize the value of their asset. They're not doing things just for the fan. I mean, can you make money? I, mean, I know you can make real money in sports, which is why we had that, that you know, Super League that then kind of went down in flames. Yeah. Is there anything for you as an investor that you want to look at? Um, as an inv they're fully priced. As an inv if you want to have a controlling stake in these things, you don't want to be a minority owner in them. Um, and then you can force the egregious things <laughs> that the fans don't <laughs> want. Um, so th I've not been attracted to any of the publicly listed uh, vehicles, and uh, th th those would be my routes to buy these kind of things. Yeah, a message directly to Mr. Bully. Think of the fans. <laughs> That's the only thing you need to do today. Think of the fans. Patrick, when you look at China and actually what they're trying to do with you know, cutting down, first of all, for um, the, the, the people that that are in government in using some of this technology that's foreign. Are we going to see a world where there's going to be such a huge split between China, Russia, maybe even India and the rest of the world that it will change everything economically and it'll change a lot for these big companies? Um, it's looking like it might be going down that path. There's still off routes that uh, we may not go down that path, but uh, we are in a bifurcated world, uh, potentially, where you've got authoritarian states on one side, a Western democracy on the other side, and uh, some middle ground countries that are trying to play into both uh, of those two types of regimes. It is a world of deglobalization, yeah. unequivocally. So um, we've gone from the 80s where Volcker broke inflation's back and we moved into deregulation and globalization, lower costs. The pendulum swung the other way now. Protectionism, stagflation, and um, populism. And, and what do you do with all of these tech stocks? I know it's, you know, th this is a step away, but this is the ones, these are the companies that did so well in the pandemic because we thought everyone would order their food in, we'd all be on Zoom and just talk through our technology and phones. Those kind of tech stocks, avoid. They still got a lot further to fall, I think. Um, these are companies that are producing products and selling their product below the cost. So that's why they're making losses and the hope when the interest rates were zero that they'd carve out monopoly positions and be able to create profits in the future. 
The minute Delivery Hero raises prices, Just Eat takes all the market share. Um, the minute Uber raises prices, Lyft takes all the yeah. market share. So they have flawed business models. They're still trading at billions in market cap, and they're never going to get on that path to profitability. Patrick, thank you so much. Patrick Armstrong, their chief investment officer at Plurimi Wealth. I'm still disappointed you didn't buy Chelsea. Think about it. You still have time, like a couple of hours, to put in uh, that second bid. Coming up, Elon Musk secures an extra $7.1 billion of new financing for his Twitter takeover bid, including from Larry Ellison of Binance. We have more on that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition of Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news, here is Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine, and happy Friday. Bloomberg has learned the European Union is proposing a revision to its Russian oil ban to give Hungary and Slovakia an extra year to comply. Under the plan, the two countries will have until the end of 2024 to stop imports. Most member states will be expected to phase out Russian fuel by the end of this year. Now, Bloomberg has learned that China has ordered government agencies and state-backed corporations to replace foreign computers with domestic alternatives within two years. Staff are said to have been asked to change their PCs for locally made alternatives that run domestically developed software. The move is one of Beijing's most aggressive efforts so far to eradicate overseas technology. The coronavirus death toll probably climbed to almost 15 million in the first first two years. That is according to a new report from the World Health Organization, which says about one in 500 people died globally during the pandemic. The figure is far higher than that official numbers and includes deaths indirectly caused by disruptions from the crisis. OPEC and its allies are sticking with their standard small monthly production increase in the face of tightening global markets. International consumers have been calling on Saudi Arabia and its partners to fill the gap left by a potential EU ban on Russian oil. The group's latest meeting rubber stamped another $432,000 uh, barrels a day increase for June. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. Now, the Bank of England issued the gloomiest outlook of any major central bank this year as it raised its key rate. Governor Andrew Bailey is warning Britain to brace for double-digit inflation and a prolonged period of stagnation or even recession. I think it's interesting with market reaction because, I, can t I mean, you know, we, we've discussed this. We have well, we discussed how we think markets might react. And you can make a case both ways, actually. I mean, I mean we, we collect a lot of intelligence and information from markets. Um, and um, our market intelligence team collects a lot of information on what people in the markets think we're going to do. It's like looking at yourself in a mirror. Um, and there were arguments both ways. So, you know, the, some people were saying, well, you know, we're looking at what the vote will be, for instance. I sort of sense from the way the markets react today, they probably didn't spend that much time on that. And, I, and I'm not saying they should, by the way, because I think, you know, I always say, you know, please read the report, read the statement, read the minutes. You know, um, take the whole thing in. So, what do you say? What do you say to the market? It's, it's currently got 118. Last time I checked, basis points priced in between now and year end. That's just shy of 25 bips per meeting. Um, is that a misprice? What do you say to the market when it has that kind of expectation built in? Right. Well, now? I'm not making predictions on what we will do. What I, I think what I would say is this. So, we do a market uh, survey. And we publish it, we'll publish the next one tomorrow, but we published one uh, for the last meeting. And what we could observe was that there was a gap between the, markets, the market prices and what the market was telling us in the survey. So the survey curve, we published this on our website, the survey curve was considerably lower than the market price. Now, you can construct all sorts of arguments about you know, market prices are, you know, have a sort of distribution of risks in them, distribution of views, of, of views of risks in them, the survey is perhaps more of a central case view. But we could observe that the gap between these two things was larger than 
you know, it often is. So, you know, we, we sort of spend a bit of time sort of pondering that. Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey there painting a gloomy outlook for the UK economy, speaking to our Guy Johnson. Now, to the latest twists and turns of Elon Musk's efforts to buy Twitter, the Tesla chief executive has secured $7.1 billion of new financing commitments, including from billionaire Larry Ellison, Binance, Sequoia Capital, and that's to help fund his proposed $44 billion takeover. Now, for more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Alex Webb. Alex, I mean, these are some, first of all, good morning, but they're really big backers. Is it that people are attracted to Twitter? that they don't want to say no to Elon Musk? Like, what are some of the dynamics there? Well, Elon Musk is in Elon the Bay Musk. Area, <laughs> a huge amount of people. You know, there's some more skepticism outside the Bay Area as far as Elon Musk is concerned than there is inside the Bay Area. And they have faith in his ability, it would seem, yeah. to actually transform this thing into more of a success than it is now. Not what, to make a, money? Well, that, that's the slightly confusing yeah. thing, that publicly he said, I'm not in this to make money. But equally, he's got investors. So he must be telling them, and it's been reported that he when he presented to banks, he presented some sort of financial vision to them so that they clearly got on board with it. We don't know yeah. what that is. I guess maybe the, often in Silicon Valley the perception is, or the, the model is, make a product people like and then the economics will follow. So perhaps that is in a sense the pitch. How's the FTC looking at this? Well, it's looking at two pieces. It's firstly carrying out a review of the deal itself. It mm -hmm. seems unlikely that they'll raise any objections. The other thing they're looking at, which could be a little bit more problematic, is how he filed it to begin with. He didn't declare the initial nine and whatever it was percent stake in Twitter when he yep. when he acquired it yep. because he said, well, I, this is a financial investment. It's not. I'm not going to do a takeover. Of course, what happened? He then ended up, you know, making it an acquisition or a takeover bid for, for Twitter. So that is the thing they're looking at. Maybe a little more questions and marks around that. Alex, yesterday we were joking around with the Binance founder that, you know, they, they should come on the show and do something about crypto on Twitter. And he said, oh, I don't really know Elon Musk. And then we find out subsequently that they're investing in it. I mean, is there a link between crypto, Twitter? Like, what does this end up being? It is something that the, you know, crypto world. enthusiast Rose. world <laughs> as, exactly, is getting very um, ginned up about that. You know, the, the whole vision for Web3, this mildly uh, non-specific but decentralized internet where um, you don't have big tech companies controlling anything, they think this is a great vehicle to push that vision. Now, of course, at the same time, Elon Musk is saying that I don't want, I want to get rid of all the bots, and a lot of the bots are crypto bots. So, you know, right. there is a balance there to be found. Alex, thank you so much. Smart as always, our Bloomberg Quick Take correspondent on technology, Alex Webb. Now, in the meantime, we'll leave you with our morning must read from John Authors. I love of it because of course it's talking about dinosaurs and we are also reaching out to a new audience i got a note from samsung the brontosaurus analogy is just so clever and smart my seven and a half year old was watching and he got so excited so good morning to all of the seven year olds out there the idea behind john author's piece is that a brontosaurus has a nervous system that was so inefficient that it would take a long time to realize it had been bitten in the tail. The analogy could work well with what's going on in the markets today. If you look at markets overall, yesterday they really fell out of bed with the Nasdaq, the S&P between a three and five percent lower. Stocks and bonds today continuing to fall on inflation worries. Of course, they also worry about rising borrowing costs and China's COVID lockdown, a depressing sentiment. But this is something that we also knew 48 hours ago. So maybe there is a reaction function that takes a bit of time to uh, fall into place. Risk aversion sweeping away the relief from rally that we saw just yesterday morning, morning following uh, the Fed decision on Wednesday. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Kriti Gupta in New York, Anna Edwards and Tom McKenzie here in London. This is Bloomberg. We're going to stay on the edge of our seats. I think that the market is trying to determine what is the most important factor going forward. So for the Fed, it's very clear. They are a single mandate Fed right now. They are only focused on inflation and they're telling us that. These are three central banks, all with slightly different challenges. Markets got drunk on liquidity post COVID. We think things are overdone. You've gotten rid of some of the excesses and the underlying fundamentals are still 
relatively good for now. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Friday, May 6. Our top stories today. Global stocks and bonds falling after that major sell-off on Wall Street. Investors are worried about inflation, higher interest rates, and the risk of recession. Meanwhile, the U.S. dollar rose against major currencies. The U.S. jobs reports out later today. There's concern that the falling jobless rate and rising wages may lead the Fed to be more aggressive with rate hikes. The report is likely to show the unemployment rate dropping to 3.5%. And China's moving to eradicate key overseas technology. Beijing orders central government agencies and state-backed operations to get rid of foreign personal computers. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards with Tom McKenzie here in London and Kriti Gupta over in New York. Kayleigh Lyons and Matt Miller are both off today. And Tom, really interesting to see the way that the uh, run-up in stocks and then the subsequent sell-off in stocks on Wall Street is really working its way into the global narrative this morning. Yeah, and of course that's been felt in Asia. The benchmark, the MSCI Asia Pacific, ended lower. The one area of green was Japan and the Nikkei on the back of reporting there that maybe Japan is going to start welcoming tourists again as the pandemic there eases. That's boosted some of the travel talks linked uh, to Japan and within Japan. But apart from that, the story is one of negativity. As you can see, losses of 1.6%. Concerns again as China reiterates that it's not walking away from its COVID-0 policy. Instead, actually instructing individuals within China not to question that policy. And then, as the headline said, that marked decoupling when it comes to U.S. tech within government agencies and SOEs. The CSI, CSI 300, the benchmark, uh, ending lower by 2.5%. Hang Seng as well, that tech stock route that we saw in the U.S. with the Nasdaq earning lend, ending almost 5% lower. That read across uh, to what happened in China because of the ADRs were battered. And you saw that tech stocks list, listed in Hong Kong, Chinese tech stocks, took a hit uh, of almost 4% as well. The Nikkei, as you can see, ended up 7 tenths of 8% again on the back of that reporting around tourism. Let's switch it on and see how things are playing out across the currency space. Then that weakness for the Chinese yuan. Year to date, down about 5% versus uh, the US dollar. It briefly went to 670. That could be another line in the sand for the Chinese currency. Currently at 668, lower by 4 tenths of 8%. The Japanese yen, lower by about 13% year to date, is 150, the next level for that currency for Japan. The rate differential, of course, becoming more extreme between the BOJ and the Fed. Of course, when it comes to China, part of it is the dollar mix, part of it is concerns about the trajectory of that economy. And Kriti, for the U.S., what are you looking at? Yeah, Tom, we are looking at a little bit of a risk-off mood when it comes to the U.S. Remember, this follows that pretty strong conviction selling that we saw yesterday. But what's interesting to me is yesterday's move, a lot of people are saying, well, it's not necessarily this panic selling that you tend to see. It's really institutionals just not really hopping in, not really buying the dip. A buyer strike, as one of our guests put it yesterday. This is important because it's that sentiment that seems to be carrying on today. Futures down about four-tenths of 1%. Even yields, a little bit of a softer move. But remember, yields moved up 16 basis points yesterday when it comes to the 10-year yield now up about I believe uh, three or four basis points call it four if you will so you are once again seeing that sell-off pattern in stocks and bonds really continue and remember when we talk about that sell-off in yields we also have to talk about the dollar as well a little bit stronger this morning but still a very marginal move and crude of course up one and a half percent this is important as the EU starts to move closer and closer towards that Russian oil ban what comes next does this pave the way for natural gas eventually that's going to be the question we ask there and even a risk off tone you can see it in bitcoin as well down about six tenths of a percent Anna. Chrissy, let's have a look at the European map then and European equity markets. Feeling some pain today, it would appear, and perhaps more than we'd anticipated. When looking at the futures picture earlier on, it looked as if a lot of this would be yesterday's story. We uh, worked in some of Wall Street's enthusiasm from Wednesday into the start of our trading day yesterday, and then some of the subsequent sell-off. There was clearly still some to go. And the fact that U.S. futures have been a little bit weaker through the, through the European session, also weighing on markets, add in there some negativity around earnings, and you get a pretty negative picture down by more than 1% on the CAC Herons and on the Zetradax. There's the earnings story. I'll come to that in a moment. There's also the FX story to focus in on. And we continue to see that the pound is weakening against the US dollar. This was happening in the run-up yesterday uh, to the Bank of England meeting yesterday and continues to be the case afterwards and is again the case this morning. 123.34 is where we trade on cable, down another two-tenths of a percent as we readjust our Bank of England view around, yes, inflation, but also growth. So that's uh, that's where the market is on that one. The euro, interesting to see how this one dropped in the last 24 hours and then as well 
worked its way back up again, back up to that 105 handle. Yesterday, the focus was on some fairly dovish commentary from one ECB official. Today, the focus on the French side, a slightly more hawkish take on things. Uh, and so as a result, we saw a little recovery in the common currency. The Adidas share price down by more than 5%, or Adidas, if you're in some parts of the world, uh, down by more than 5%. This on concerns around their business in China. That is also weighing on some of the Asian providers to Adidas uh, through the Asia session. IAG down by 8.5%. This is the aviation business, the operator of British Airways and uh, Iberia, amongst other uh, airline brands. And they're blaming Omicron, basically, for the way that their backward-looking numbers disappointed the markets against estimates. Quick look at some Russian assets. And, Chrissy, we will focus next week on what's going on on the inflation side of things. You were talking about the European position on Russian energy, and that is still being closely watched by those who are playing in what some describe as fairly broken markets over in Russia. But that is being watched. And will there be extra time given to Hungary and some other European countries to comply with those rules around oil and energy products from Russia? That is one of the questions hanging over these markets at this point, Chrissy. Yeah, it's a lot of fascinating stuff when it comes to Russia in particular. We have to see how those capital controls really play into the markets and how we are really going to be dealing with that in light of that sanctions ban. Anna, thank you. Let's look at what's coming up ahead today. We're going to hear from the Fed with John Williams, Neil Kashkari, Raphael Bostic, and James Bullard all speaking today, of course, after that quiet period. We'll see what they have to say really on those Federal Reserves. Counting is also underway in the UK local elections. Boris Johnson's conservatives have already lost control of three London strongholds, and we'll get that U.S. jobs report at 8.30 a.m. New York time. Tom, a very heavily watched report as we talk about whether or not uh, how tight this labor market is and just how much work we still have to do. Yeah, the participation rate and wage increases will be in focus, uh, we know, with the forecast for 380,000 in terms of these non-farm payrolls. And, of course, getting back to that market reaction, the whipsaw that we've seen over the last 24 hours, stocks and bonds, of course, continuing their slide this morning after yesterday's sell-off. Steve Major of HSBC spoke to us earlier. There's a different mindset that's needed to trade a market like this because, because we, we are clearly in a in a very inflationary uh, time, time period and the, the hawkish response is only just coming through. So, so the behaviour of markets and therefore investors is different to what most people who are, who are trading today would have experienced. OK, joining us now is the one and only Eddie van der Volk, Bloomberg Markets Live Editor. Eddie, talk to us about the market psychology, what it tells us, the delayed response from the equity and bond markets to this decision by Jay Powell from the FOMC and, of course, that presser. Yeah, you know what? I think Stephen Major made a really interesting point there, that this is a very different environment and the market will have to be ready, you know, thinking on its feet. You can't just buy the indexes. I've been saying that all morning. I think, you know, people need to, to, to pass the message a lot more. And I think what came through initially, there was a little bit of relief that the Fed isn't going to hike 75 basis points. You know, they're not going to completely squeeze the market so far. And then people sat back and they said, well, actually, why isn't the Fed even considering 75? Look at where inflation is. What is it that they worried about? Are, are they seeing something in the growth picture that we're not seeing? Are they worried more about stagflation now? You know, is, 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 it, is it no longer just a single focus on a, uh, uh, you know, can they no longer just singly focus on uh, inflation? They have to start thinking about mm. the growth picture as well. And I think all of that's coming through. And I think all of that will be illuminated by the uh, jobs report later today. Yeah, absolutely. Moving on to the jobs report, expectations there then, Eddie. Is it a situation where uh, we're going to see even good news interpreted as b bad news by the market? Yeah, over the last few months, the CPI reading has been a much, much more important reading than the jobs report. You know, we've just seen the volatility around CPI much bigger, but I think that's going to shift back. I think right now that the jobs report will tell us, you know, whether that labour market is still as tight uh, is the Fed is and, and wage growth is wage growth still happening at the pace that it has been? You know, we want to see a little bit more about the participation rate. All of those things will tell us whether the Fed's policy is having any effect and whether it's having too much of an effect. And I think, therefore, you know, the jobs report is becoming the real, the, the, the absolute key uh, number for me again in markets at the moment. 
at Eddie Vanderwalt of Bloomberg MLive. I think he's 100% right when he talks about that wage growth. He's really seeing that. So, so add so much pressure to the U.S. jobs report today, which, speaking of, it's expected to show employers added another 380,000 jobs in April, a moderate step down from March. The unemployment rate likely fell to 3.5%, while average hourly earnings rose at a monthly pace of 0.4% and 5.5% on a year-over-year -year basis. Let's get now to Emily Wilkins, our Bloomberg government reporter in Washington, for the politics of the report. Emily, walk us through it. This is clearly a very heavily watched jobs report on Wall Street, but I'd like to hear the Washington take. Well, Creedy, I mean, you're looking at that unemployment number. It is expected to tick down a little bit to 3.5 percent. That's going to give President Joe Biden and the Democrats a chance to say, hey, look, we're getting America back to where it was pre-pandemic, pre-COVID. That's certainly something that the Biden administration wants to tout. But they do have that continuing problem with inflation. We are expecting to see wage growth, but not really keep up with that continuing sky-high price of goods, services, and gas prices right now. That's what's going to really hurt President Joe Biden and Democrats in November are those high inflation prices. And the, obviously, the Fed is focused on trying to get those back down, trying to even things out. But right now, you really have seen Democrats rely heavily on those unemployment numbers, trying to make their case that they have done what is needed for the economy during this pandemic. Mm, 380,000 then expected on jobs created and an unemployment rate of 3.5%. We'll watch for those numbers. Emily, thank you for the political take. Emily Wilkins of Bloomberg Government there in Washington. And don't miss our interview with the U.S. Labor Secretary, Marty Walsh. That's a conversation that follows the jobs report. Uh, that's at 9.30 a.m. in New York, 2.30 p.m. in London. Now over to the European story. With inflation rising and the outlook for the European economy clouded by the war in Ukraine, top EU policymakers have been gathering today at a special session seminar in Salzburg to discuss the continent's policy response. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo spoke to the EU budget chief in Salzburg this morning. I'm confident that there will not be any kind of recession and even not uh, stagflation because uh, there is such a strong economy. I mean, if you look at the labor market in Europe, we are lack of labor forces, etc. So I think we have full order books. Uh, we, we face problems in the supply chain in the global supply chain, this, that's an issue. And of course, uh, the, the war is affecting us. Maria joins us now from Salzburg uh, after conducting that interview a little earlier. Maria, what is the biggest policy issue then that European officials gathered behind you are talking about? Yes, Anna, and this is all about inflation, inflation, inflation. And, uh, of course, uh, we know that European uh, price surge is really now affecting pretty much everything in the continent, and this puts the European Central Bank in a difficult uh, position. They have to show that they can get a hold of this. And remember, in this side of the world, there isn't a dual mandate. For the ECB, it's about hitting that target of below but close to 2 percent. And in some countries in the EU, that now triples uh, that target. So, of course, there is now great growing pressure for this move to happen. Remember, up until now, Christine Lagarde had really guided the market to this end of QE in June, then potentially this rate hike in July. I think it is very clear now that the ECB will have to hike. The question is just how fast. And, uh, of course, the other big implication for this is what's the impact on the growth uh, picture? And, of course, the commissioner there says, I'm confident that we can avoid this recession. But, Anna, I can tell you that behind the scenes, there are concerns and there are worries about it. The European Union is very exposed to the Russian story and we haven't seen the full impact of those sanctions and we haven't seen the end of those sanctions uh, by the way so yes there are concerns behind the scenes perhaps quietly but there are concerns about that recession even stagflation I mean Fabio Panetta of the ECB he says it out loud in my opinion we're already de facto in a, sta a stationary excuse me stagflation uh, scenario and just very briefly and of course a lot of this will depend on the war in Russia and for the time being we're not seeing in anything that would put an end to this. There is no ceasefire. The peace talks are completely over for the time being. And over the past 48 hours, we've seen Vladimir Putin really double down on the city of Mariupol, hoping uh, perhaps to have this big parade on May 9th, celebrating potentially what he will pitch to the Russian people as a victory over fascist uh, Ukraine and the dark forces of the West. Of course, Ukraine will deny all of this. Yeah, so a rate hike on the table for the ECB, potentially, but the complexities of the geopolitics. Maria today on the ground in Salzburg, thank you. Talking of geopolitics, China ordering central government agencies and state-backed corporations to replace foreign-branded personal computers. 
for US computers with domestic alternatives within two years. The campaign would kick out at least 50 million foreign-made PCs. Bloomberg's Ender Current joins us from Hong Kong. Ender, what do we know about this? When I was in China, there was a move to reduce the reliance on Microsoft and some of the hardware, some of the computers uh, from the US. I remember speaking to local government officials. They say, well, we'd, we'd like to do it, but quite frankly, our kit is not up to scratch. What's changed? Well, that's right, Tom. It appears to be an aggressive acceleration of that push for China to engender its own self-reliance and to cut its reliance in particular on technology and hardware from trading rivals. And a lot of that comes from the vulnerabilities China has suffered in recent years with the US and others targeting national champions like Huawei and the rest. Uh, and of course, China also has its own national security concerns and that's why it wants to bring a lot of this in-house. So it seems to be an acceleration or a speeding up of that policy attack that you have mentioned, they have in recent years been pushing towards more self-reliance and now we seem to be getting uh, some numbers on that. And as you mentioned, it could be around 50 million personal PCs being impacted by this directive from the central government that obviously will impact uh, for foreign manufacturers of, of laptops and PCs, but of course it will boost China's own manufacturers too. Bloomberg's Enda Curran, we thank you so much for that report from Asia. Let's take a look at some of the stocks moving in pre-market trading. Of course, here in the United States, Peloton shares declining after a report of a potential stake sale. 15 to 20 percent is on the table. And of course, you are seeing shares drop on that report. What's interesting here is this is coming off of the back of simply this major pandemic boom in some of those growth. Your names, Peloton, Zoom, et cetera, the ones that were really doing well at that stay at home era now starting to really lose a lot of that cash flow, lose a lot of that business and investment bid. So what other option is there but to take it private? At least that is the thinking for some of these names. You can really see it weighing on the stock. Like I said, down one and a half percent. Let's take a look at Tesla shares rising a little bit in the green here. Oh, well, down now, but it was in the green. This comes after it said to boost production in a Shanghai plant in mid-May. Now, the reason you are seeing a little bit of volatility in Tesla shares because on the one hand, they're going to be meeting some of those or pushing to meet some of those growth uh, deliveries and growth delivery numbers. The really big targets that they had for, Ch for Shanghai and their plant specifically but now, as we talk about COVID lockdowns, extended restrictions in Beijing as well, how, what is the likelihood of them actually accomplishing that? So that's why as you see these kind of new targets from Tesla, you do see some volatility. So, of course, we are going to keep an eye on those shares. Tesla shares about flat trading right now, but of course, anything can change once the stock market opens. Let's take another look at Fubo TV. Another downside stock down 15% reporting sales that trailed estimates. Remember, Fubo TV is a major streaming platform for a lot of sports networks. So if we're comparing this to the likes of Netflix, Disney, CNN Plus, for example, Fubo TV really coming under some pressure to really keep that subscriber base up, Anna. And this is going to be a really important conversation as we talk mm. about what the future of media and streaming specifically is. Yep, a lot of competition for your time. Now, coming up on this program, then we'll talk about the market sell-off, Chrissy. Matt Maley joins us, Militay back, chief market strategist. Great voice to speak to on a day like today, following yesterday. And Elon Musk's right-hand man who does everything from lining up Twitter deal financing to digging up dirt on adversaries, apparently. Read more in today's Big Take story by typing NI Big Take into the terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomer Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards and Tom McKenzie in London. Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines are off. Now, we are coming off of a day of a pretty brutal sell-off, a 5% decline in the NASDAQ, the biggest going back to September 2020, that tech wreck ahead of the uh, 2020 U.S. presidential election. This is important because it's not just the stock market we're seeing sell-off. We're seeing the bond market sell-off as well. And you can see when both are moving to the downside, where are people putting their money? But I think the more important question is what is the precedent? You haven't actually seen this going Going back to 1994. So Lynn Thomason, Bloomberg Markets editor, she joins us now. Lynn, I wanted to pose this, pose this question to you. Why are we seeing everything sell off? Where are people putting their money? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, as one investor put it yesterday, you saw investors really starting to throw in the towel. Um, and I think there's a sense of fear that inflation is going up, interest rates are going up, and that's really a bad mix for stocks and bonds. Um, and, you know, even things like Bitcoin, gold, everything is just kind of heading down in mass. And, you know, investors are talking about cash really being the place to be.
Cash being the place to be, commodity still in, or is that in question because of concerns around growth? Yeah, and also the stronger dollar. I mean, the stronger dollar is also bad for commodities. Um, and, you know, I think, but clearly, you know, with inflation going up, commodities are still going to be a, an area where people are looking at. Yeah, certainly as an inflation hedge, a lot of people talk about it. One of my favorite lines from our Bloomberg News colleague, in markets there's turbulence, then there's whatever you call the last two days, which I think <laughs> pretty much it sums things up. Uh, Lynn, thanks very much for being based. Lynn Thomason with us to talk about the market. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here is uh, the first word. In China, top leaders have warned against questioning President Xi Jinping's COVID zero strategy. The Politburo struck a more defensive tone as pressure builds to relax the restrictions and protect the economy. China's economic activity contracted sharply last month. On Wall Street, dealmakers may see their bonuses for 2022 drop by as much as 40 percent. Their problem, a slowdown in IPOs and underwriting. That's according to the compensation consulting firm Johnson Associates. Meanwhile, traders could increase, see increases as much as 20 percent. Plenty more coming up on these markets. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Global stocks and bonds falling after the major sell-off on Wall Street. Investors are worried about inflation, higher interest rates and the risk of recession. The U.S. jobs report is out later today. There's concern that the falling jobless rate and rising wages may lead the Fed to be more aggressive with rate hikes. And China's moving to eradicate key overseas technology. Beijing orders central government agencies and state-backed operations to get rid of foreign personal computers. The move could result in 50 million foreign PCs being dumped. I'm Anna Edwards with Tom McKenzie here in London and with Kriti Gupta over in New York. Kaylee Lines and Matt Miller are off today. And Kriti, we're still living with the after effects then of the sell-off that we saw on Wall Street yesterday. Yeah, we really are. You are still seeing that uh, perhaps a little bit of a risk off sentiment in futures right now. And this is really important as we simply talk about what the actual trade is. I mean, this is significant because if we're not hopping into stocks, you're not hopping into bonds, where is the money going? We've talked about dollar strength a lot, but it's kind of that sentiment that you're starting to see continue into today's trade. So futures down about 1.6 percent, so already seeing that conviction selling. But is it actually panic selling? We're going to address that later. We also see the 10 year yield up three basis points. Remember this falls a 16 basis point move yesterday. So that volatility, not just isolated in stocks, it's in the bond market as well. You are also seeing a little bit marginal stronger dollar following those interest rate differentials. But crude is where you're seeing a lot of the action up about 2%. A lot of this has to do with the expectation of the EU barreling ahead with that Russian sanctions ban. The quirks of it are something to really get to know. We're going to uh, talk about that in a little bit as well. And Bitcoin down four tenths of a percent. So if you're looking for a risk off sentiment, you are finding it across all asset classes. Let's get to some of the individual pre-market movers, though, because it's not just a macro sell-off. You are seeing some micro drivers as well. I want to start off with Peloton here. Shares declining after a report of a potential stock sale, 15 to 20 percent, a potentially minority stake. This is still according to reports. This discussion still in progress. But this is important to keep in mind because this is coming off a major sell-off in some of those growthier names that did so well at the stay-at-home era. Peloton, really a, a key kind of a case study for that, if we will. Tesla's going to be another one that we want to keep an eye on this morning, Anna. It was actually up over 1%, and then it has paired some of those gains. Tesla, this comes after saying it's going to boost its production in a Shanghai plant in mid-May. But once again, square that uh, ambition with the growth concerns out of China, and you do see some volatility in the stock. And I'm going to end here with Fubo TV reporting sales that trailed estimates. It comes back down, Anna, to the earnings that come from streaming companies. We heard from Netflix. We heard from CNN+. Plus, We heard from Warner Brothers as well. Mm. How many people are actually invested in the streaming space yeah. and in the success of, of the streaming networks. 
Yeah, Chrissy, you talked about the macro and the micro factors influencing the US market. That's certainly clear here in Europe as well. Uh, from a macro perspective, the big picture story, we're down by 1.5% on European stocks, picking up from negativity on Wall Street yesterday. The futures picture looks a little weaker for the US as well. That's working its way into the sentiment. But we've also had some gloomy earnings stories, and that is weighing on things as well. We're watching the pound. We're also watching the euro. Just in the last couple of days, we've seen some slightly more dovish voices taking center stage, switching the focus to uh, growth instead of inflation for just a moment but today we saw more hawkish voices coming through in the shape of the Bank of France uh, and as a result we saw some recovery coming through in the uh, euro 105 regained as the handle on the single currency 105.64 up two tenths of a percent to the micro and some of those stories that disappointed just a little bit we're down by 5.2 percent more than a bit there uh, for the Adidas share price this as this company cites concerns around their business in China and that was something that weighed on their suppliers in the Asia region IAG the aviation business it owns uh, um, uh, British Airways and also Iberia, that stock down by 7.3%. Of course, it was about the earnings, the backward-looking story, the, the fact that the Omicron uh, recovery had been maybe slower than they'd anticipated, and so the numbers disappointed, essentially, the market's expectations. But perhaps we're also nervous about higher energy prices because energy stocks are moving higher today, and Chrissy showed us the uh, higher oil price that we're seeing in these markets. Quick word on Russia. Next week, the focus is really going to be on the inflation story out of Russia, and there we will start to ask questions about just how tough the sanctions environment has been, how much tougher it can get and what impact, what pain effectively that is causing for the Russian economy. Chrissy? Yeah, a lot to watch, Anna. When we talk about pain in the Russian economy, let's also talk about pain in the markets here, specifically the stock market sell -off we saw yesterday. Chris Murphy, the co-head of derivative strategy at Susquehanna, he spoke to me yesterday about an interesting piece of the sell-off. What exactly is driving it? Take a listen. Sure, investors are hedging, but you also have to remember, we're hearing a lot about how degrossed everything is, and the volumes in general are not that high. It kind of feels, you know, a little bit more like a, a buyer strike as opposed to, you know, investors that have all these positions on that are panicking, you know, putting on big hedges for more downside. Well, joining us now to dig more into that is Matt Maley, Chief Market Strategist at Miller Tabak. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. I have to really dive into this because it's important to see who is selling and why they're selling. As we just heard from Chris Murphy, this idea that this isn't panic selling. Your take. Yeah, I mean, we we have seen, you know, a pickup in volume a little bit, but not much more than we saw, uh, you know, on, on the big up days either. I mean, uh, we saw earlier in this week or even, you know, two days ago. Uh, but but the thing is, is, is when you get this, you know, you know, panic. There's a difference between panic selling and forced selling. You know, panic selling is people say, "Oh gosh, get me off, get me out at any price." Forced selling, of course, is when you get margin calls and such, where some of these leveraged players uh, have no choice but they have to sell at any price. It doesn't matter if they think it's ch cheap or oversold; they just have to sell. Uh, the good news is that at some point, when you get kind of that that forced selling, uh, the, you know, those margin calls. Uh, you, you do get a, a kind of a you know a washout move, a capitulation move. I don't know that we've really seen that yet, uh, uh, but it, it seems like we're getting close to one. And we'll see what happens. This weekend is going to be very important because you know a lot of people have lost a lot of money. You worry about this, you know, some big hedge fund going to blow up. Uh, are we going to have you know they're going to have to you know uh, unravel a bunch of positions. Uh, that could be a, a, a fear. But you know we're, we seem to be getting for it's close to something that will at least give us a, a bottom, a near term bottom. But uh, longer term, we still have this issue of inflation so we really have to be worried about that okay so matt you're watching the next few days and whether this uh, the economic financials in terms of the conditions uh, lead to any unusual uh, events how do you want to be hedging uh, with this environment there's been a call to hedge within equities within areas like healthcare. does that does that align with your views yeah, I mean, I, I've been cautious since the beginning of the year, and I've been saying that people should be raising cash on any kind of bounces, and that's been a, a you know a, a good idea. I think it will continue to be that way. Uh, and uh, you know, we look at you know hard assets. What does well on in inflation? Hard assets, and the oil sector, you know, that continues to do well. Uh, we want to stay with that, and I, and I do think that the healthcare sector is fine too. But anything with with, with hard assets, and it's interesting. Everybody's talking about uh, housing bubbles and such, uh, but one of the good things that uh, uh, real estate uh, is. That Good, was a good hedge in the 1970s uh, because that was a very similar time, even though people say it's not as bad as the 1970s, but that was a supply-driven uh, uh, bout of inflation and uh, because, you know, that was the OPEC uh, oil embargo back then. And so it's very similar in that way. And, th and those are the kinds that, that we worry about cause stagflation. So hard assets are really one you to look at. Also in the agricultural area, like, you know, uh, Archer Daniels, Midland, uh, stocks like that uh, can be real uh, places where you can hide for now.
Uh, we were speaking to Stephen Major of HSBC a couple of hours ago. He said he thinks 3% on the 10-year is now uh, the floor uh, for the yield. What is the read across to the tech sector? Does that just keep the cap on any potential gains when you do get a dip like you saw uh, in the last 24 hours or so? Yeah, I'm afraid it does. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it is high enough to, to, to create problems there. I mean, one of the things that, that we forget is that, you know, interest rates have gone up. And even if the, 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 they're, you know, still relatively low on a historical basis, uh, they're still at, at a level that pr has to bring uh, what, what we consider fair valuations down. And uh, a lot of these big cap uh, tech names we've been so used to with all the uh, uh, global uh, central bank largesse that we've gotten from them for really for a dozen years now, uh, that's disappeared. And so uh, with interest rates higher, those valuations have to come down. And uh, it's just going to be a while before those big cap tech names uh, really come back to uh, you know, come back into a rally in a big way. Mm. And Matt, on tech, when would be a good time to think about getting uh, back in. I was talking to one tech analyst, a tech uh, share, share owner earlier on today who was who was uh, bemoaning the fact that the market just sells off everything, even when he was arguing that there are some parts of the tech space that do have some pricing power. And you saw that in some areas of the earnings. Yeah, that, that, that's the one thing is, you know, we've what we've heard all year and it's true is it's, it's a stock picker's market. And some of these stocks uh, are getting uh, really knocked down. And the ones that, you know, you look at a stock like NVIDIA, uh, advanced micro devices. I mean, you know, it, the stock is well below. It got hit really hard yesterday. Uh, these are some of the names that, uh, you know, do have pricing power, do have, you know, I guess my, my point is my concerns are because of valuation levels, not because of their companies and their prospects. Now, this is not, you know, this is not 1999, 2000 all over again. These are good companies. They just got ahead of themselves. So, like, you know, the difference between a stock and a company and uh, the companies mm. are really good. The ones I just mentioned, their stocks are just a little too far. And as we move through the next, I think, the next few days, there are going to be some great buying opportunities. OK, and looking ahead, we've got the non-farm payrolls number coming in a few hours, Matt. We've got uh, that jobs report hitting. Is there anything that could be contained within the jobs report that would be positive for risk assets? Or does it all, does it all uh, lead to higher interest rates? Well, I mean, the one thing is, some people say, "Geez, hopefully it's, it's a lower number," uh, and therefore uh, it was. People will say, "Oh, geez, that's going to cause the Fed to pull back." That's fine, but even as, as Fed Chairman Powell said this week, I mean, he flat out said, "Hey, listen, we we can only control the, the demand side of things. We can't control the supply side of things, and that raises the, the specter of stagflation even higher." Uh, and uh, if it if if we do get a weaker number, does that tell us that uh, geez, the economy is getting weaker, so therefore inflation is going to get weaker? Or does it really tell us that it's supply-driven inflation and therefore we're going to have stagflation? So uh, I'm a little bit worried that, that, that this number is not going to be all that helpful. But uh, again, a lot of this selling has, been, has not been fundamentally based. It's been because of uh, margin calls and other forced selling issues. Hopefully that will pro pro provide for a bottom, a near-term bottom. But longer term, I, I still think people should be raising, uh, raising cash on, on, uh, on any kind of rallies. And then later in the year, you're going to have an unbelievable buying opportunity. And, uh, you know, ones that, we, that we've seen in the past that have, have been followed by, you know, multi-year uh, bull markets. Matt, thank you very much. Thanks for your thoughts. Matt Maley, Miller Tarbeck, uh, Chief Market Strategist. Coming up on uh, the Open, in fact, so, so a little bit later on in programming, Mohamed El Arian, uh, Gramercy Funds Management Chair and Bloomberg Opinion Columnist, of course, uh, ex of PIMCO many years ago now. That's at 9.30 a.m. in New York, 2.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live shot at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, EU Economy Minister Paolo Gentiloni at 12.30 p.m. in New York, 5.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards with Tom McKenzie in London and Chrissy Gupta in New York. Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines are off today. Now, there's concern that today's U.S. jobs report may complicate the Fed's inflation fight. The report is likely to show employers added another 380,000 jobs in the month of April, but intense labor demand risks sparking even faster wage growth at a time when the Fed is already trying to tamp down the highest inflation in four decades. Simon Kennedy, Bloomberg Executive Editor for Economics, joins us now here on set 
in London to talk us through what to expect. And Simon, it's felt for quite a long time like the market's attention hasn't really been on jobs, it's been on inflation, but of course with the tightness of the labour market, they are really linked. Absolutely, and you're going to see a wave of data today. It could go either way, but um, certainly, uh, you know, historically, you might look at the payrolls report, and then after that unit labour cost data yesterday, people are tuning into those average wage gains. Is there a... Uh, a risk of a, uh, of a wage price spiral. You know, we like higher wages, but central bankers, and we saw this with the Bank of England yesterday, sometimes edgy about those higher wages because they drive prices up, and then you're into a, uh, a spiral that's very hard to restrain. So a lot of uh, eyes will both be on the unemployment rate, which could drop back to a pre-pandemic low of about 3.5%. But also that average wage data is, uh, is critical for the Fed's outlook. Yeah, 3.5%. It's remarkable, isn't it? Are we at the point where that labour tightness is starting to draw additional participants into the workforce? Are we seeing any evidence of that? So we're seeing it slightly at the margins, but you know, you've, there's this conversation about the great resignation and people staying out. Certainly there's uh, labour shortages in certain key areas, the same again in, in the UK. Uh, so the hope is, the hope of the central bankers is that they can pull more people back in, that, that draw of higher wages, perhaps also the, the, uh, the kind of the push of, of paying more at the, uh, the checkout. Uh, will pull people back into the workforce. But again, that labour participation rate, another key number. Previously, you know, we'd, we'd, first Friday of every month, we'd look at the payrolls number, we'd see it go up, we'd see it go down. This, the report is far more meaty, far more uh, uh, intensively looked at, not just, uh, not just the headline, but, okay. but, but beneath the so surface. So the detail matters. Critty, mm -hmm. jump in. <laughs> well, I'm curious about the real wages as well. I mean, Simon's been talking about this. This is important as we talk about not just inflation, but the inflation per income class. For a while, the lowest income class actually had the highest real wages. And I'm curious if that trend is going to change. Well, we'll have to see. But, you know, that's a, that's a critical uh, uh, part of the debate. And it's also a kind of an unfair... Uh, for the people who are seeing wages go up uh, aggressively for the first time in years, it's kind of unfair to then read that this is uh, being per perceived by central bankers as a, as a bad thing. But the, the more people who can be drawn into the labour force, but remember that was the aim of the Federal Reserve. They changed their framework uh, coming up to two years ago uh, in the aim of, of, of running the economy hotter. And now they seem to, uh, to be, if not regretting it, then, then moving faster. Certainly even um, Jay Powell talking uh, uh, recently about, with hindsight, uh, they might have moved for mm. a, a little faster. Um, and you know, Diane Swank, an uh, economist who was uh, on Bloomberg Television, uh, yesterday pointing out that uh, unemployment affects you know, a few people uh, compared to uh, inflation, which affects every person. So uh, that, that's another dilemma for the, uh, for the central bankers. And, and Simon, what did we take away from the Bank of England this week? There's almost a sense that this is a central bank that's been hiking for a while now, so not, uh, not, uh, not late to this, perhaps, or at least they're earlier than some other central banks. Do you get a sense that they're pivoting on that tightrope? We've talked a lot about how there's a, a tightrope to walk along for the, for the Bank of England. And it's been an all about inflation, and now increasingly it is about concerns over growth. Well, if a tightrope can narrow, it did yesterday at the, <laughs> the Bank of England. That is a brutal assessment of the economic outlook from probably any central bank. I think every central bank, if, if honesty is the best policy, then the Bank of England pursued that yesterday. Um, but within the bank, you have differences. You have, you, know, you, get, you had people voting for 50. You have people looking to the outlook and saying, no, no, we're probably done with raising mm. rates. So you've got this 50 camp at the most hawkish. They might want to get that extra 25 next time. You've got the people who were 25 going, OK, maybe we go again. And then the th th uh, third group of two policymakers saying they don't really see more, at more hikes. So that's an incredibly difficult position for the Bank of England, perhaps more so even than the Fed. Uh, you know, they were pretty yeah. honest in their assessment, 10% inflation. Uh, they didn't use the recession word, but they see a contracting economy next, uh, next year. Um, who'd be a Bank of England a policymaker? Yeah, tough gig. Yeah, that 10% inflation, a lot reliant on where energy prices go and the way that, because of the way that the energy cap works here in the UK. So interesting detail there. Uh, Simon, thank you very much. Bloomberg Simon Kennedy with the latest on various uh, macroeconomic themes, the central banking lessons of the week and the data to come. Coming up later, sticking with the jobs report, in fact, we'll get a view on the jobs report from the US Labour Secretary, Marty Walsh. That's at 9.30am in New York, 2.30pm in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards and Tom McKenzie in London. Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines are off. 
Tom Keen joins us now on this Jobs Friday. Tom, your single best chart today. Well, it's, you know, pretty. it's a Jobs Friday, but I'm sorry the markets have intruded and the markets continue this morning with some really interesting dynamics. I'm looking at Yuan, Turkish Lira unravels, and Sterling had a really ugly 3 a.m. hour in New York. What I look at, though, is the equity markets. This is a chart we've had out. Through all of the pandemic, it's the correction bear market chart in yellow, a 10% correction in red, a bear market on a log axis, which means that the proportions are equivalent. What is different this time, Critty, is the length it's taken to get here. From the peak of a number of months ago, it's taken much longer to get to a Dow Jones correction level. Short and sharp has become longer and prolonged. And Tom, you've got Randy Krosner coming on to help contextualize where things stand uh, with the Fed on this jobs day. Yeah, this is a, he's always with us, but it's a really perfect day to him to talk to uh, Tom to talk to him and that uh, it's about the financial system and how it folds into the jobs report and what that means, not just for the Fed, but for the labor economies of the United Kingdom and Europe as well with the ECB uh, coming up. Really looking forward to speaking to Jeffrey Rosenberg of BlackRock as well. OK, fantastic stuff. Tom Keane, of course, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Thank you. And Bloomberg has learned, switching focus to what's happening in sport, that a deal regarding the sale of Chelsea Football Club may possibly be announced today. That would end a two-month process after Roman Abramovich was sanctioned, of course, by the UK government following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Let's get more then with Bloomberg's Laura Wright. Laura, who is the new likely owner? What do we know about the potential deal? Well, Tom, the Americans are coming. The new expected owner is Todd Bowley, who is leading the consortium, who are said to be the front runners. As you mentioned, we may get news today. He's formerly president at Guggenheim. He founded Elridge. And he's an individual that has experience owning sports teams. He's the co-owner of the LA Dodgers, a US baseball team. There's a sense of urgency with this deal to go through because the special operating license that the government granted Chelsea expires on May the 31st. And the government have signaled little appetite in order to extend that license. It's been a competitive bidding process over the last two months. And if successful, Bowley's consortium will have fought off stiff competition from other wealthy U.S. investors, including the Bain Capital co-chairman and also the Apollo Global Management co-founder. In terms of like American influence in the Premier League right now, eight of 20 teams have some influence. Three teams are wholly owned by Americans. That includes Man United, Arsenal and Liverpool. So the Americans are coming and are already here, it would seem, in UK sport and, uh, and indeed in, in some football clubs in other parts of Europe as well. Now, there have been reports, Laura, that this could all get held up by uh, conditions around a loan that a Roman Abramovich did or did not ask to be paid back. What's the latest on that? Well, basically, during his tenure as the owner of Chelsea, Roman Abram Abramovich lent the club £1.5 billion. He was sanctioned on March the 10th by the UK government shortly after the sale was announced. Initially, he said, don't worry about the money, it's OK. Then reports emerged earlier this week that bidders were asked to front up an extra £1.5 billion. That would be a problem because currently Roman Abramovich is not allowed to receive a single penny in the UK. Then last night, a statement came from Abramovich's spokesperson refuting that he wanted the loan repaid refuting that he'd increased the price of the club last minute but look this is in the context of a Chelsea owner that's won five Premier League titles five mm. FA Cup titles and two Champions League titles and he says look I just want the best for the club going forward and he will still have overall say over who that new owner will be Bloomberg's Laura Wright bringing us all things Football, as I'm told, it's called, or soccer for our American audience. Thank you so much. <laughs> Definitely football. <laughs> oh, well, 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 we'll have that discussion at on another this story. time. Just we'll... on this story. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I concede. Laura Wright, thank you so much. As always, let's get a quick check on these markets. Weaker futures already, a real connection here, or I should say a continuation, Anna, of what you're seeing from yesterday's mm. price action. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, the session here in Europe, a little weaker, a lot weaker actually than the futures picture had led us to believe it would be. And some of that is to do with yesterday and the sell-off in New York, but also to do with the earnings stories we've had here in Europe today, which have not been, uh, not been fantastic. Also worth noting, a little bit of strength returning to the euro after a day where we were hearing a lot of dovish voices around the euro, Chrissy. Now some more hawkish ones getting through and the euro gains just a touch as we get towards the start of Europe. Yeah, and we'll keep an eye on that dollar, of course, as we ha hear about the U.S. jobs report coming shortly. For now, that's it for early edition surveillance is ahead with Tom John Lisa stick with us this is Bloomberg